the Word of God as we hear it today poses what it seems to me, at least, on first hearing when you put it all together, a rather seemingly self-contradictory call. On the one hand, we have the words of Jesus, follow me. And then the words of one of his most distinguished followers of all time, Paul the Apostle, who tells us, you were called for freedom. Freedom, Paul says. The title of a biography of St. Paul, I love it. It's uh, Paul, the apostle of the heart set free. And this same apostle says of himself, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Who in turn, Paul tells us, emptied himself as God and took the form of a slave. And yet Paul says very clearly, for freedom, Christ set us free. So this word freedom is just laced through the, the, the passage from St. Paul today, and yet it's mixed with slavery, voluntarily chosen. What's going on here? Well, what I have tried to do is for myself is to sort out, so to speak, slavery and liberty. I want to make a distinction between liberty and freedom. We'll see why in a minute. Liberty, at least looking at my life, liberty is when the time and space of my life are mine, my own. I come and go as I want, where I want to go, when I want to go, it's mine. In, a, in shorthand, the, the, the liberty is a way of describing a way of life that I have chosen because I know my life best and it's the way that seems to be the best for me and I will choose it. That's my liberty. We can appreciate that better when we contrast it with what slavery is. Slavery is when my time and space are under another's control. We could think of the extreme example of that in the last century in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. Or you could think of a prisoner uh, at the uh, jail this very day. The time and space are under another's control. I come and go, not as I want, but as they want. Children often consider their parents to deprive them of liberty. I was thinking of this, uh, somehow or other it came to mind thinking of this scripture when I was about a freshman in college, I think 40 some 50 years ago. The, uh, I wanted to go that summer, we lived in Prineville and I wanted to go to work on this project in Nyssa right on the border of Idaho with Spanish-speaking people for the summer. And my parents said no. Uh, I had a plan for what, where my time was going to be and a place where it was going to be, and it conflicted with my parents. And guess who had the final say? You know? And guess who felt uh, oppressed and beaten down by that? <clears throat> so this is the, the, the situation we find ourselves in and how true to experience the gospel is today, as always, but listen to this. Jesus says of these people, come follow me, he says, and, and one person says, I will follow you, Lord, but first, let me go and bury my father. And another says, I will follow you, Lord, but first, let me go and say farewell to my family. I will follow, but first. This, 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 this. Well, what this reveals <clears throat> is that we're torn and divided interiorly. I want to follow, but on my terms. On the when and where of my choosing. And the reason for this, I think, is that I'm afraid if I don't, I will lose my liberty. It'll be gone. To come and go as I want, when I want, where I want. I'll lose this. Well, the one who's speaking to you is an expert 
on, but first, some of you may know that I was, I was 45 years old when I was ordained a priest, and I had a long time to say to the Lord, I will follow, but first, but first, first just for a year, then first for five years, then first for 10 years, and on it went. So I know very well the, the putting off of the uh, responding to the call of the Lord to his service. But it seems to me that that's not my, by any means unique to me because as we look at, the, for example, the plummeting marriage rates in our country and in the world, just plummeting people getting married, uh, that seems to me to, to, to speak to this very question. Uh, that spouses before they consider marriage or looking back on their life, before they got married, they say, I will get married, but first. Or then they think, I will have children and a family, but first. Because when you think, especially about when the children come along, uh, I don't think you're going to be able to just take off anytime you want to go anywhere you want to go. Your, your liberty is going to be drastically restricted because of the responsibility you have you could say, for the liberty of others. And so this is the dilemma we sort of find ourselves in as human beings, really. And this is the, the, what Jesus is addressing today when he says, follow me. So let's return to what St. Paul says at the beginning. For freedom, Christ has set us free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Well, what is freedom? Freedom. 1976, I was studying Spanish in Mexico, and I came across this little holy card in a bookstore there that I still got, I looked at it many, many times. And it says, uh, Ser libre es poseerse a sí mismo, which is to say, to be free is to be in possession of oneself. To be in possession of oneself. To appreciate how important this is that we can consider the contrary, that if I'm not in possession of myself, someone or something else is. Nature abhors a vacuum. And so someone or something else, for example, riches, the desire to have ever more and more and more money and possessions, or power, to be able to control perhaps the people right around me or then a larger group, and then even a larger group, always to have more and more control. And then uh, pleasure, of the infinite numbers of pleasures that, that can be sought, uh, all of these things can take possession of me and do. When any of them dominates the time and space of my life, I've lost possession of myself. Even with all kinds of liberty, and human beings in history have never, ever had so many liberties as we have today. They are liberties that would have been unimagined, some of them even 10 years ago. But even with all kinds of liberty, I'm not truly free if I'm not in possession of myself. My outer liberty is a mask for interior slavery. I can't really be free if I'm just free for me. Freedom must somehow be for others or it's not freedom at all. When I am in possession of myself, I am free to give myself away so that others may be free to do the same. This is the whole point, as the scriptures show us, the, journey, the description of freedom in the, in the Bible, the whole point of reaching the promised land of freedom is so that you can, the, the promised land of self-possession is so that you can dispossess yourself so that others may be free and live. Unless I can give up my liberty, I can never discover my freedom. This is certainly the lesson of my life, that if I had continued for another 10 or 15 years to say, I will follow, Lord, but not, but not yet, but first I'll do other things. If I had continued that another 10 or 15 years, I never would have been a priest. 
never would have had 12 years at Sacred Heart Parish, never would have become a bishop. In other words, I've never would have had my real life. And that's the Lord's patience in calling us, come, come, follow me. The freedom to be the person God made me to be. I said that we have the promised land of freedom and that at the heart of the promised land of freedom is the greatest example of freedom that we'll ever have in history. And it's this, the cross. The passion of Jesus shows us freedom overflowing, overflowing. Consider the, the attitude we know very well that with, with Jesus enters his passion, we know it from the scriptures. The, in the, uh, the night before his death, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what's, what a, the abyss, and the dreadful abyss that he's about to step into, the darkness and the suffering of the next day. And overwhelmed with this, he says, Father, let this cup pass me by. Because he knows full well what he's stepping into if the Father continues to ask him. He says, but not as I will, but as you will. This is freedom, to give himself away at the deepest level, to surrender his will for all the time and space that he has to the mysterious will of the Father. And then he repeats that in different words as he hangs upon the cross the next afternoon. He says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He literally gives his life to the Father completely. And so with this attitude of perfect self-possession, self Jesus enters the upper room with his disciples for the Last Supper. The greatest act of human freedom that will ever be enacted on this earth. It's unsurpassable. Because Jesus takes bread, as he will do here in our midst now, takes bread and says, this is my body for you. And he hands his life over to his disciples. And then he takes the cup. This is my blood, which is given for you. Take and drink. Take and drink until the chalice is drained. He gives everything that he is and has to his disciples. That is to say, to you and me. So you and I, this hour, are going to be on the receiving end of the greatest single act of freedom in the history of the human race. But that's not all, because the next day on the cross, we see very dramatically and unforgettably that Jesus lays down his liberty. We can th see that in, in, the, in the two beams of the cross. There's the, the vertical beam and the horizontal beam. The vertical beam of the cross is the reminder to us of Jesus surrendering his space, the space of his life, because that cross is planted in one place, and that's all that's available to him. He can't choose to go to another place because he's pinned to that one for as long as his time endures. There's no room to move. And then we look at the horizontal beam of the cross, and that represents the time of his life. He there is suspended in time, and he has no, nothing he can do to change that. Time passes Jesus by, leaving him no future but death. He's out of time, and he freely gives his time. The cross is the defeat of Christ's human liberty. It's absolute and total defeat. But that's not the end. Because miraculously, he rises from the tomb. The resurrection intervenes. And human freedom is raised up victorious above every time and place. This is freedom. This is freedom. Life beyond the reach of time.
can, he can now gift himself to all times. That's why he can gift himself to you and me today, because he's free to do that. And he's also, the stone has been rolled away. There is no limit to the extension of his love in our earthly space. And so he says to his apostles, go out to all the world and tell the good news. My brothers and sisters, we now gather to celebrate the banquet of freedom. The banquet of freedom. In the Eucharist, Jesus hands us the living bread of his freedom, so that we can make it our own possession and live it in him. We no longer, as St. Paul says, it's not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. This is his, his report of what it is to live with a heart set free in Jesus Christ. I no longer live, it is Christ that lives in me. And yet Paul, just the identity of Paul doesn't just get covered over, it emerges with unforgettable clarity because he's taken possession. He has willingly let Christ possess him. Follow me, Jesus says. Come to Mass. Come to Mass. Along with the plummeting uh, marriage rates are plummeting rates of Mass attendance. And we wonder why there are troubles in the church. Come to me. Come to Mass. It is for freedom I have set you free. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. 